just want to start by saying, how well do you, do you all know each other? Very. Very well. <laughs> if you want to turn this into a roast, we could. Really? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> so they much ammo. Yeah. They know my yeah. <laughs> you can bring him in too. Let's go. Give us, give us a little no, taste of it. No, 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 no. We want to talk about the issues. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. But you know what, David? <laughs> you know, to your, your question, though, the fact that we have known each other for so long, to see that we've made this progression from where we were, say, 10, 15 years ago to where we're at now, is just really inspiring. You know, when you talk about the kids and others that are watching us, watching what we're doing, I think it sends a good signal to the city, particularly when you talk about a city that has been stigmatized by racism and to see people of color in the positions that they now occupy, I think it just says that the city is evolving. You mentioned the word inspiring. And right. the big reason we're doing this story is because our photographer, Ron Mitchell, was on the field at Fenway Park when the three of you were there. And he came back to the station and he said to me, David, I think this would be a great story as someone who grew up in Boston to see three African-American leaders out on the field. It moved him. Well, Did it move you to, to be Absolutely. Yeah, we're very cognizant of the, the history of Boston to the negative. And this shows progression for our city. Um, you know, those, those times, those days of yore to the negative were teachable and learnable moments for us. But it's our job to pave the way for the next generation, no matter where they hail from, what ethnicity, to show that, you know, truth, justice should be equal, right? and opportunity should be out there for everyone and that we have overcome the negative path and we are very committed to making sure that anyone's path that anyone wants to follow our path that it's, it's uh, more easily done i would also just add that you know although they're uh, both uh, accomplished you know respectively in their own right um, that uh, and that is a credit and a testament to each of them individually that um, their historic election and appointments are sh collective and shared victories. And so, you know, they labored, they did the hard work, but um, these are victories that the entire city Absolutely. celebrates in. And I certainly felt that the night that we were on the Fenway, um, people were just so excited to see us together. And that was maybe two days after. Um, or maybe three, after uh, my primary win. And we were walking through and people were just high-fiving and fist bumping and mm -hmm. people um, who, who are fortunate enough to call Boston their home, but people that were visiting as well. And they all felt some connectedness to uh, the paradigm shift that is occurring here and um, felt a part of it and a sense of pride. When you mentioned, Sheriff, the, the kids who see this happening right now, what was it like when you were kids? You in New York, you in Chicago, Hillsborough, and then here in Boston. Hillsborough, Maryland, Baltimore, then to here in, in yeah. Boston in 1975 before you were born. Um, compliment. I was born in 74. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I, I was, was born in 74. I, I know it was close. But, you know. We're all I, well preserved. Yeah, okay, very well. So. I'll just say when I arrived in Boston, it was, uh, you know. How old? I was 12 years old, and they were very racially tumultuous times because of force busing. And trust me, the neighborhoods were divided, black, white. That was the big argument, black, white, segregation. A federal judge had to come in and um, attempt to set things right. But you have to know this about Boston neighborhoods. It doesn't matter what neighborhood, you can't tell them what to do. You have to work with them to make the changes, but still, Racially tumultuous times, and definitely there was racism. But um, I was taught very well by my grandmother and mother. If you want, to, you want change, be the change. If you know your history, you know your self-worth. Everyone helped build this country, including this city. So if you want to do something, you, you should uh, be afforded the opportunity to, to do whatever your dreams um, so Everyone uh, seems to have that person in their life that inspired them. Who was it for you, Sheriff, as you were growing up? Well, there's a couple things. I just want to touch on what, uh, what the commissioner was just talking about. So I hail from New York City where we did have black and Latino politicians. Yeah. And so coming to Boston was a little different for me because the only name that I really heard of when I got here was Mel King. 
I didn't hear, and there were others, but I didn't really hear of the bowlings and others. And so I felt like I'd stepped into a vacuum by not having that representation of color. And so to see, I got here in 76, to see where it was when I arrived to where it's at now, I think we've made a heck of a progression. Absolutely amazing. In, in, in so far as who inspired me or who I looked up to, frankly, it was really that village you know, I grew up in a single parent household for yeah. quite some time. My mother battled alcohol abuse. And so I was parentified at a young age because I have a younger sister who's 13 years younger than I am. The thing about my mom was that although she had an issue, she was able to function. What I mean by that was she went to work, she came home, made sure that we had food on the table, that we did our homework. Unfortunately, she then drank herself to sleep every night. So that was really tough. So I had to grow up quickly, but it was the neighbors around us that made sure that my sister and I, you know, had the preacher comforts, the things that we needed, and then extended family. Yeah. And I, Ianna, it sounds like your mother was just an incredible force for you. Certainly. The most formidable influence in my life in every way. My mother was a tenants rights organizer, a social worker, um, a legal secretary. She held a variety of jobs um, to, uh, to make sure I would never be denied or deprived any opportunity to receive a quality education. But um, the role that she played that was the most uh, formidable in sort of shaping me and my civic engagement and my activism is that of a tenants' rights organizer. Um, you know, I think the word entitlement has sort of been negatively co-opted, but she made sure I knew that we were entitled to live in a community where we felt safe, um, to have access to health care that was quality, to have a job that treated us with dignity and paid us a living wage, uh, schools that were highly performing. But she also made sure that I knew that it had to be a partnership. That this was not a responsibility that we were to place squarely on the shoulders of those in government or just at their feet, but that we needed to be in, in partnership. Um, the other thing is, um, despite that there, the fact that there were many reasons in, our, in the condition of how we lived and where we lived um, that we might have felt unseen and unheard, she made sure I knew that on election day we were powerful. And I really bought into that very early on. I remember going, she was a super voter, every election, walking into that booth with her and she would pull that curtain and when I would exit that I would stand a little bit taller I always reminded myself we are powerful um, and that is certainly something that I've tried to impart as an elected official myself that um, community voice is powerful and is necessary I want to be held accountable I don't have a problem with activism or agitation um, this sort of disruption is what what leads to real change um, the last thing I would just say is that I know we're all first and history makers respectively and collectively but I doubt any of us set out to make history. Um, and I think so sometimes what can get lost in that um, in just highlighting the, um, the historical significance of our elections and our appointment um, is everything else. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sort of everything then just becomes about that. And uh, I certainly am aware that we made history, but I didn't run to make history, I just wanted to make change. So what you're saying is the headlines scream first person to do this, but you're worried that that's all that gets said. That that's all that gets said. And, and you want to focus on the issues and what still needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, making history is one thing, but we all want to make headway, although we're each aware of the historical significance, and we don't want to give short shrift to that yeah. um, because that is important. Um, but whenever I think about the fact that he is the first ever, and he is the first ever, and that, you know, I'm the first, and you couch that in... 230 year history of our congressional delegation to never have a person of color to represent us in the U.S. House of Representatives. The fact that I was the first woman of color elected to the Boston City Council took over 100 years. And so as much as we, um, you know, celebrate that progress has come, it has come incrementally. And there is much, much more work that needs to be done for us to realize leadership parity in the city. Yes, so uh -huh. where do you think, Commissioner, where do you think we are now? As a so, when it comes to racing, where do you think we need so to So I'd to? like to touch upon that and that my brother and sister here, right? Those are elected positions, right? And if you look at how they were voted in and by whom, they were voted in by everybody in the city, black, white, Latino, Cabo Verde. Um, that's showing a marked progress in Boston that they were elected because they can do the job. You with over 48,000 votes, right? That came from everywhere, right? So that's some marked progress in the history of Boston that we are moving forward. Um, the bonus is because of our ethnicity, it shows that some people, a lot of people are seeing past the color of our skin 
and, and just saying, can you do the job? Yeah. And the voters have spoken. I mean, 48,000 votes, the amount of votes that you got in on too, everybody was voting. Black, white, Latino, whole color of the rainbow. So where we're at now, um, we're in a great place in history, but we still have work to do. We always have work to do. Like you said, 200 years for me since 1854. If you want to go further back, since 1630. Um, but again, we're here to pave the way so that others that are coming behind us can have a much smoother road. So let me say this though. It's great to be the first, but we gotta have the second, and the third, right. and the fourth. And so we can't just stop here. And I think that, I think that what happened uh, September 4th, you know, with Ayanna's winning and Rachel possibly being the next district attorney, and Liz and Nika and John Santiago, you have that, that changing look in the city. You know, so now you have a black police commissioner, black sheriff, black congressperson. The city council president is an African-American female. There are six women of color on the city council. So the city is really rapidly changing. And as the commissioner mentioned, black and white, Latino and Asian, everybody's kind of buying into that we have a bigger mission here now. Yeah. With so much turmoil going on around the globe, we have to have each other's back. We can't be at each other's neck. And skin color does not really govern that. It's the ability. To get yes. the job done. Exactly what I was talking about. I agree with that, but I would say um, I don't subscribe to this um, notion of a post racial America. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to discount my race or my Absolutely gender. Not. Um, I'm not interested in people being colorblind. I just don't want my race or my gender to be a barrier to my contribution to the world. Yeah. But I want you to notice it. I just don't want you to discriminate or deny uh, me bringing to bear my full contribution. I think um, corridors of power, decision-making tables, all benefit from that cognitive diversity, a diversity of perspective, opinion, and thought. Um, as an example, when I was first elected to the Boston City Council, uh, I created a new standing policy committee, which I hope will exist in perpetuity as I you know, move on higher ballot, um, and it's a committee focused on those issues that disproportionately adversely impact women and girls. It didn't exist before, not because no one cared about those issues. I just brought a different perspective. Yeah. Those first round of budget hearings as a freshman counselor, when I would ask about what they were doing for girls and women, they didn't have much to offer. Now they come with binders. Do you know why? Because someone asked the question, and that's where all leadership begins. Someone has to ask the question. And so there was a shift in what issues were being raised. And I think ultimately, that's the benefit of that cognitive diversity. Our lived experiences are different, and all of us have our own unique and lived experience. But it's important that we are using that around decision making and policy making tables and in the corridors of power. Everyone benefits. Sure. So oftentimes Boston will be in a headline for being a so-called racist city. And oftentimes it will come from a comedy show like Saturday Night Live where Boston becomes the butt of the joke when it comes to racism. Do you think that that's deserved, or do you hear it and go, you know, you don't know Boston nowadays? Well, I'll turn it over to the, the homegrown one okay. to speak more. Yeah, you know what? Uh, like I alluded to earlier, we, we can't forget our history. There was racism, and people did die at the hands of the criminal justice system. Um, there, there was racism in this city. But decade after decade, you had forward-thinking individuals that wanted to move this city forward. Whether they were white, black, Latino, Cabo Verde, um, people never gave up. And how do I know this? We have living history in this city that will tell you that. And as we all know, living history, they have no filter. They tell you like it is. So number one, you have to learn from your history, learn from your mistake, and ensure that those are teachable and learning moments, and then you move forward. Um, now, by moving forward, um, we have to educate folks about who we are and where we are today. If you look at the face of law enforcement in Boston right now, if it was totally racist, you wouldn't have an African-American police commissioner, an African-American transit chief, Chief Green, an African-American Suffolk County Sheriff, an African-American uh, DA, soon to be, an African-American U.S. Marshal, John Gibbons, and let's go across the river, Charles River, yeah. an African-American uh, Commissioner of Cambridge, Branville Bard. 
So when you so, hear that, when you hear that joke, right? Does it bother you? So it just allows me the opportunity to to educate people about where we are in Boston. But until everyone feels that way, feels that you know Boston has moved forward, then we still have work to That's do. Right. Like I just said, we have work to do in educating people about what Boston looks like now. And you alluded to it earlier about what the face of politics looks like now. Um, Suffolk County Sheriff, my brother, look how many people are elected to office that are of color. If you had a truly racist system, right, um, that wasn't uh, interested in progressing, then everybody wouldn't have voted. So we still have work to do until everyone feels that 100 percent, then we have um, we have to educate folks about who we are, what we are, and our capability. There's a lot of pride here. Um, these two are tenacious in how they serve their constituency. And um, that's, that's what it's about. We need everyone to see what look color at, Boston is now. It, this way, though. it took us centuries to get where we're at now. Mm -hmm. It's not going to change overnight. No. And so people, I still have friends in New York where I come from that say, why are you still in Boston? It's still a, it's a racist city. They don't know. They haven't been here, but it's going to take time. So what do you say when someone says it's a racist city? I say that it's going to take time to change that impression. I say that it's not as racist as it was when I arrived here in the late 70s, but it's not as good as it could be. But not as racist isn't exactly a ringing endorsement of the city. But it's the truth. It's the truth, you know, and so I'm not going to deceive anyone. I'm not going to deceive people that I've grown up with that I know or the people that I work with and talk to. And it doesn't matter the color of your skin. Yeah. There's still some serious challenges here in this city. Absolutely. You know, I mean, racial challenges in yeah. this city. But here's the, here's the thing. Our differences are our strengths. And once we really wrap our arms around that, then I think it makes for a better community and a better society. But it's going to take time. And I think, you know, we are better than we used to be, but we're still not who we can be. And so, you know, I'm still operating from a place of aspiration about our getting there. But, um, you know, given the, the disparate outcomes um, that persist throughout the city of Boston and the Massachusetts 7th, which was a big part of the reason why I ran, I mean, if you look at the Massachusetts 7th Congressional District, from Cambridge to Roxbury, life expectancy drops by 30 years and median household income by $50,000. So um, we can't say that race doesn't matter sure. because what we're living in is the residual and generational buildup of policies that were discriminatory, um, that did have a disproportionate impact on low-income immigrant and communities of color, and so we're still digging out from yeah. that. So when I when I'm thinking about race, that's what I'm sitting in is the disparity and and the experience and the condition. And so even if we are making strides when it comes to uh, leadership parity, um, the daily lives of people and everyone feeling they have an equal opportunity, not just to benefit sure. from the prosperity of the city, because that, that is important, but to contribute to the prosperity of the city. Um, that is really and so, the work that this. needs to be done. But watch this also. So our sister here who's going down to Washington is really now on a national level. And so the things that we've been talking about locally are gonna be talked about sure. nationally yes. with a very strong voice. And I, be I believe that you'll begin to see perception about the city change. Um, I'm going to ask you in a moment a, a couple of sort of um, societal issues that I want to get your, your, your thoughts on. But before I do that, you, you know, when you, when you have a, when you're well known, you have a big name, you have a recognizable face, sometimes people treat you differently than they might other people. Do you, can you give me an example of, in your own personal lives, how you still see it here in our city? How you still see racism? Well, listen, listen. So, and I don't mean so, from I don't mean for people you work with or people you no, 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 I mean no. for you. No, no, no. Let me give you a, a, a real clear illustration. So I'm sitting here in a, a suit, a shirt, and tie, but I can walk down one of these blocks, and I, a group of white women could be walking in my direction, and they will cross the street, or they will stop, or they will clutch their bags. That still happens today. Even though I am the sheriff, I may have a recognizable face and a recognizable name, but I'm still a black male, you see? Yeah. And what they're looking at is not Steve Tompkins, the sheriff. They're looking at a black male and all that we have been stigmatized by the media and others, not to, I'm not denigrating the media, but yeah. you understand what I'm saying, yeah. that that's a challenge, you know? And that's something that you, it, it, it happens so often that yeah. you look past it and sure. you just I, keep moving forward. Oh, yeah. 
I've seen what's been written about uh, the congresswoman-elect, the Suffolk County Sheriff, and myself, written in our local newspapers. You want to see some racism? Read the comments. The comments and you will see that we still have work to do. Yeah. There is some of the most racist comments yeah. I've ever seen. And so what does but that you know, say? Those are some of the most cowardly people that exist. I know, who but I think racists are cowards. Things. They don't yeah. have the ability to learn about someone else or see past the color of their skin. But it's, it's not like a kumbaya time sure. here. Uh, as I said, we still have work to do in educating people. Just read the comments. I mean, your local news, newspapers, if, if there's something positive said about us or we share views and opinion, read the comments. And look, we just had a young lady and her husband who were on the street on their motorcycles, right? Yes. And uh, a man just attacked them because of their race and automatically associated, associated them with, with crime in the neighborhood and shootings. So, again, not to be redundant, but there's a lot of work still to be done uh, before this is a Shangri-La. <laughs> uh, let me ask you about, so you mentioned the, um, you mentioned Rachel Rawlins, um, who we, we would have actually had part of this, but it, seeing as she hadn't been elected yet, it felt strange because then, you know, it's not fair to her opponents. So that's right. bias here as well. Um, Rachel Rollins' idea of having this list of crimes yes. that she would not prosecute. What are your thoughts on that as a police commissioner? Well, I've had the opportunity to meet with Ms. Rollins, and she stated that that list came from her website. Now, when I was asked about that list before, I said this. I'm a big respect person. I said I did not talk to her to discuss what was on that list to see how she would contextualize what was from her website. But since I've talked to her, we talked about first offenses and um, programs, uh, diversion programs, and that's something that she needs to contextualize. Um, we've had a great discussion about what we want to do for the people of, of Boston. And the district attorney and the police commissioner and our first responder family, especially law enforcement, we have to be on the same page. So I would just say give her an opportunity to contextualize um, what she um, has on that list and give her an opportunity to, to tell her side of it. I did. We talked again about diversion and talked about um, um, first-time offenders. Yeah. So I would leave that contextualization up to her. But I know if crimes are committed in Boston, if we have probable cause to do so, we will be locking people up. It's not going to bother you if she doesn't want to prosecute after? It depends on um, where we're at. It's got to be a case-by-case -case basis. You can't group everything in. Just like everyone that carries a gun is not a bad person. Some folks are forced to carry guns or duped into that. But then you have repeat offenders, sure. which if it's a repeat offender, I have a problem with that. Yeah. But... Um, but Again, when you say a case by case basis, it's definitely case by not, case. But having basis. a list is not usually a case by case. Basis. That's why she needs to contextualize that and okay. go over that. It would be rude of me and disrespectful for me to give her opinions on what she thought. She has to do that. What do you think about this list of? Items? I would just say that what I appreciate um, about her vision for this office, um, particularly in light of the fact that we have a president right now who, um, and an administration that is criminalizing and vilifying the poor. Um, that violence is ultimately a byproduct of poverty. And so I really appreciate the social and racial justice lens that she brings to these issues. Uh, we should not be tying up the courts and people's lives um, when what they really need to be is in a treatment bed, you know, or getting access to behavioral health and mental health services. And I think ultimately what, that's what she's talking about. It's not about in any way compromising the public safety, you know, or creating an ecosystem of, 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 uh, of chaos and you know, uh, a lack of order or a public safety or, or law enforcement. Um, I think what she's offering ultimately is something that, that saves us all. Uh, you know, it, there's less of a, a social and a human toll. Uh, and I think in the long run, you save money too. Is it uncomfortable, just real quickly, Sheriff, before you jump in, is it uncomfortable when you're sitting here and I could tell you probably don't agree with the commissioner on this? Oh, I don't think we disagree. No, I like case, case by he's, case. He's not going to speak for her, and he yeah. did no. say he supports what is being diversionary. So when I talk about yeah. violence being a byproduct of poverty, it's the same thing. We should not be vilifying uh, people for being poor. 
to show the black and Latino demographic in the Commonwealth is about 18%. That same demographic in my facility is 65%. So my question is, how do you get 65% out of 18? And I look at racism and I look at classism. That's how you get that. And so when you have some of the things that uh, Rachel has talked about, it stimulates conversation. Now, I may not agree with everything that she has on that list, but I've talked to her, as we all have talked to her. And she's coming into an arena that's new to her, frankly. And so I think it's incumbent upon us, those of us that have been there in the political arena and in the public safety arena, to have that dialogue with her and that discussion with her. But the fact that a former president and a senior senator uh, from the Commonwealth referenced that said this is something that we need to talk about as yeah. people, as a collective. And so I think it's a good thing that she's looking to interrupt and wake up people to say that we can no longer continue to put our people in jail. You know, as an industrial nation, we incarcerate more of our citizens than any other industrial nation on the planet. And yeah. by far, you know, we can say that we are the richest, the most affluent. We have the most resources. But we also sure. have an out of control homeless situation an out of control drug situation, and an out of control situation where you're putting black and brown and poor in jail. That's gotta stop. And I think what she has said is gonna to continue to stimulate that conversation and that debate about yeah. doing this a different way. So it sounds like even if it doesn't become full practice, it's, it's nice that it actually started a conversation. Absolutely, and to, his, to um, I'm not sure which, which one of you fine gentlemen made the point, but um, uh, the sheriff referencing that Barack Obama Sort of, you know, um, you know, called her out and offered some effusive praise her way. Um, all eyes are on Massachusetts, um, and and in my estimation, selfishly, that's how it should be. You know, we are supposed to be, uh, the, 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 you know, we're the birthplace of abolitionists and suffragettes. This is the home of marriage equality and health care reform. We are innovators. We are disruptors. We are pioneers. We are trailblazers. Um, and so I do, you know, I. We need for that story, especially now as it is evolving, uh, and there is a new paradigm shift being ushered in. Um, and to the sheriff's point, you know, if there's, uh, we, you know, feel some gratitude about being the first, but we don't want to be the last. And right. it's incredible that in my election in 2009 to have broken that double glass ceiling, and I guess the sky didn't fall in, so the electorate said, let's keep doing it. And so, you know, now uh, out of the 13 member body on the Boston City Council, uh, we have six women, um, six women of color, uh, and two of whom have held the gavel uh, as president. And so that's a mandate from the electorate. So yeah. to the commissioner's point about change, um, that those elections were a mandate from the electorate to, to say this is the brand of leadership we want, um, and we do see the benefit of having people that have a different lived experience and bring different lenses to these discussions. But more work to be done, boards, commissions, uh, and a lot of work to be done to improve these disparate outcomes. Real quick. If you look at our, our <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance, the words that jump out at me is one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mm -hmm. So we are one nation, but we're a very divided nation. And liberty and justice has not been afforded to all of our yeah. citizens. So whoever your God may be, you need to look to your God, we need to look to each other to say that this, this paradigm, it has to change, it has to shift. And I think that's where we're going with the three of us and others that are going to follow. Let me uh, end with, because we're running out of time, just end with something um, just a little, maybe uh -oh. a little lighter, a little bit more personal about you guys. Um, I don't know you well enough to even say this, but it seems to me, Commissioner, that you're sort of like the, the, the fun uh, jokester of the three. Is that true? Well, I think we all have our moment, but uh, <laughs> you have to have a balance. See, we have a very serious job, it's a very serious job. He's, so he's witty. He's I, witty. I love but this guy's a star. I like yeah, I love being lighthearted. <laughs> you like to be lighthearted. There's a teddy bear, but there's a grizzly inside. I'll leave you at that. And Ayana, you seem like you are serious, but not always. I'm pretty serious. Yeah, I'm but pretty. Not I'm, I'm pretty yeah. sober, yeah. but but not always. You know, so I have my off-color moments. Tell us something that would surprise us, Sheriff. Tell us something that would surprise us about. He can't because he'd have to curse. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And I know her husband. It's not happening, brother. <laughs> she does have a sense of humor. She does have a sense of humor. She does have a sense of humor. Have I, it's on record. She does I, have a sense this. of humor. I take the work. <laughs> I take the work very seriously, um, but I don't take myself too seriously. Yeah. So, yeah. And how about you, Sheriff? 
Look, You're I'm a little just, bit of both? I, I, oh, yeah, I'm a prankster. I like having a lot of fun, but I like getting the work done. Like, we I love like, getting like, the work yeah. done. We work, work, yeah, work. Yeah, I mean, we work well, but you know what? I really like, particularly in the in the field that I'm in, I came late to that party. You know, yeah. my background was in communication. Yeah. The sheriff thing and, and public safety is something that, although I've been there 15 years, I'm still learning. And so what I have to have is an open mind. And do I like guys, surrounding myself with people that know more about it than I do. You didn't do it here in front of the camera, but do you guys ever have heated debates? We've had discussions. We've had discussions. I, 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 I have to, yeah. yeah, I have to say, yeah. we, we do hold each other accountable, yeah. right? And it's not always a love fest, but it is always a respect, respect. fest. Yeah. Always yeah. respectful. Yeah. No crabs in the barrel trying to claw each other. When we have discussions about those who we serve, um, we are very passionate. And, and we I, will have the discussions. Absolutely. And I would say that this is a unique uh, fraternity and sorority, if you will, and that it's a very unique path. It is a blessing and an honor to be the first to anything, but it also carries with it a unique um, and awesome responsibility. And so it is wonderful to have people that you can speak candidly with um, about the joy you know, and the pain of that experience. Um, and, and I think we're tough on each other when we need to be uh, because we also want to maintain the integrity of our relationship. And if we're not operating from a place of truth telling, um, that doesn't benefit anyone because ultimately we just want to do good work for the city and this commonwealth. There's, there's also praise too. Like we That's were, true. we were at Mother Caroline's Academy. I That's didn't even know she was there, and I was talking to a group of young ladies That's about true. your accomplishments, and they were like, "I was like, right oh wow, I didn't even know." <laughs> so so you, you've, you've talked a lot, and for good reason, about the work that needs to be done in the city. It's not but over. A lot of work needed, needs to be done. Do you ever find yourself these days just stopping for a moment, even for moments right now, and saying, "You know what? This moment right now is pretty hmm. cool." Oh, that happens all the time. Yeah. You know, that happens all the time. When you look at where we're at, we're blessed, frankly. Definitely we blessed. We are blessed. And so, yeah, you do look at yourself in the mirror and say, can you, I mean, sometimes I pinch myself and say, damn, I, can I, I can't believe that I actually have the, the, the avenue to help people improve their station in life. Yeah. That's an awesome thing, you know. And so when you're standing at the pearly gates and you're looking at your maker and you say, look, I did the best I could, please let me in. That's a, that's, 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 a, that's a really good thing. I just say I thank seniors worry, every day. Thank you. I thank my mother <laughs> and the seniors who helped pave the way and so I could be here in this capacity. Every day I meet seniors and I thank them because they made my road much easier, your roads as well. Yeah. And that's seniors of all colors, but, uh, you know, especially for our race, they really went through some tremendous hardships here in Boston. But... You meet the seniors today, like the seniors I read, excuse me, met uh, downstairs in a reading room. Wow. Just a tremendous sense of pride when they see us. Yeah. So I live for them. I live for all the seniors that, that did the right thing and paved the way or learned lessons so that now they are doing the right thing. Yeah, and now you're doing that for 